Good evening, folks, and welcome to another V Brown Bag webinar. Um, this evening is going to be a continuation of our Python for DevOps series, uh, talking with Python developers and learning how to level up our skills. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking with Mr. Tom Burge, and we are going to be presenting Building and Deploying a Python Tool with Flask and VRA Cloud, which has been officially named VRA Cloud. Um, so uh, it, this is actually kind of cool because we're going to be doing a bit of a crossover, um, as as you as most of our attendees know that V Brownback has spent a lot of time doing all the VMware stuff, and and uh, since we've been peeling off into cloud and and more developer stuff, this is a wonderful confluence of of the different things. We've got some VMware in here, we've got some cloud, and we've got some Python. So I'm I'm especially excited for uh, for tonight's talk. Um, but first, as always, we've got a couple of housekeeping notes. Getting on the conversation, uh, if you at V Brown Bag or hashtag V Brown Bag, or if you're in the live studio audience, uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A panel, and I will field them and, uh, and ask all of your wonderful questions uh, to Tom um, as, as we proceed through all of the wonderful Flask and Python and cloudy knowledge that he's going to be imparting upon us. Uh, also, obviously, we have... Well, I say obviously, but you can, if you're reading, you can see that we have the V Brown Bag Latin America channel, and we also have the V Brown Bag EMEA channels, and those happen on Tuesdays and Thursdays, respectively. So, um, with all of that shenanigans out of the way, Tom, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hey, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the power, and you are now officially the presenter, sir. Awesome. Cool. I can see your screen. Yep, we're good to go. Um, uh, for, forgive me, I'm a, not a PowerPoint wizard, and I typically shy away from that. So whenever I do talks and demos, I do them live, so we're not showing magical architecture. That's perfect. Um, that. <laughs> so we wanted to talk about building and deploying a Python tool slash the VRA cloud. So the first thing I want to talk about real quick is just a little bit of my background. Uh, so I've been a staff systems engineer at VMware for about two years uh, doing cloud management. So cloud management covers everything we realize. Uh, so all of the on-prem products for we realize as well as the SaaS services that we've been coming out with. Uh, prior to that, I have over 10 years of experience in customer IT operations, uh, being um, systems architect, server team lead, senior systems engineer, all the way down, right? Uh, beyond that, uh, I have experience from the military. I was in the military for eight years in the Army. Um, I actually cut off some IT time and I actually went in and did non IT stuff in the Army. Uh, and then after the Army, got my degree, everything, I did healthcare IT for several years and then I came over to VMware. Uh, I started on this Python journey a little over a year ago, probably about May last year. Uh, I had off and on done some stuff like looked at C, C, fast shell scripting, things like that. Never really got beyond a whole lot of like PowerShell uh, command scripting, things like that, right? Uh, but once I started getting into Python, um, one of the things that actually led me to that was looking at a lot of the AWS stuff. I wanted to learn more public cloud and, and Lambda and serverless really caught my eye. Uh, and a lot of the stuff I started to see out there was really based on Python. So I really wanted to just go down the Python path. Uh, so. I've been doing Python stuff for about a year. Uh, I'm still a newbie, so a lot of the stuff, the way I have it, and what I'll show you in some of the scripts and in my GitHub, is probably not the most efficient way to do it, we'll just say, but that's just the learning process, right? Exactly. So the, the, tool, the tool I wanted to talk about and show a demo of, and then show how I'm kind of automating that, the build of that tool and how we're gonna deploy it is uh, it's for a, a platform that we call DICE. DICE is basically an SDDC strategy tool that allows us to, to take customer data out of their environment, put it into this tool, and build recommendations and strategies for them uh, so they can do license optimization, so they can consume the right number of licenses to get as many of the SDDC products as possible for the best bang for your buck, basically, right? Uh, but it's all using the customer data, and, and it's a big deal to pull the customer data out instead of us just making stuff up and then hoping customers believe what we're saying. Uh, so that's really the basis of what this is. So what we wanted to start with is the use case. We had the TAM data manager tool, which is all the VMware TAMs use this tool to build reports for the customers that they work for. 
uh, and they used that to pull data from vCenter, and that's how the DICE tool kind of started collecting data. But they did run into a lot of limitations because that, that tool was purpose-built for TAMs and what they needed for it, and DICE kind of just had to modify itself to, to use what they were pulling out. So one of the things that we talk about in cloud management a lot is how we can actually add stuff from vRealize operations in DICE, because vRealize operations has a lot of analytical type of data in there for capacity planning, right sizing, and all of that plays in the conversation when we're talking about SDDC optimization. So being that uh, I was one of the biggest people pushing through those changes, I was basically told, hey, go make it happen and show us what you can do. And that kind of jump-started my Python learning. Uh, I've been taking some courses on like Udemy and reading blogs and just kind of going through a bunch of these example projects. But the way, the way I personally learn, I don't really learn by people just showing me stuff. I have to actually learn by breaking it, fixing it, taking it apart, building it up, and changing how it works, right? So this actually became a really good opportunity for me to kind of up-level my Python skills because I felt like I kind of hit a plateau. Um, and I did. And until I got into this project, it, was, it allowed me just to conceptually see like just programming in a different way, right? So I've been an infrastructure guy most of my career, pretty much all of my career. And now with the direction that VMware is taking with a lot of products, you look at all the like Kubernetes and developer focused stuff that we have coming out, that we have to start talking to a lot of those people. So I started to see in this project, not only like learning more about Python and some other stuff that I'll show you on another slide, but I started to just think more like how those type of folks think and just get those ideas going in my head, right? And so the whole whole new world of things to me that I had not really thought about or didn't really think about thinking about things that way, right? Uh, one, thing, one thing about the TDM tool Ed, is that it only collects from vCenter because uh, that's really all TAMs needed to do. So one of the objectives of this tool was to collect as well as vCenter and vRouse. That way we could take combined amounts of those data because if a customer has like 50 vCenters and you have to do 50 collections, that's, that can be painful at times. Uh, but the, the TAM tool also can only be used by internal VMware people and we actually wanted to roll out dice and enable a lot of our partners to help us do a lot of this stuff and help their customers since most of the time partners are a lot closer aligned to the daily operations of customers than just vendors in general, right? And the, and the TDM tool was, it's not hard to use, but it did become a little bit cumbersome because like I said before, it was purpose built. So we wanted a much easier tool that customers could keep and kind of maintain and use themselves, and then also partners could do that as well. So the, the, the technology learning slide, this is a one that I was going through and I was thinking about it. So obviously all, all of the code for in the GitHub is basically Python. Um, anything that's not Python is just like the HTML and CSS frameworks. Uh, and I actually use the Clarity UI that VMware's open source and developed. Uh, and I kind of, you'll see, you'll see some similarities from, from some other stuff whenever we, I bring that up. Uh, then I base it off of obviously Flask. So when we look at Python and the frameworks that we have, uh, there's a couple, there, there's a couple out there that are Python based. And I wanted to stick just Python based because I didn't want to try to learn like Python for the back end setup and then JavaScript and all this other stuff for the front end because I'm very like, I like to be focused when I'm learning something or I just go in a bunch of different places and I never really get anything done. So that's why I, I opted to use Flask. It's extremely small and, and it's super fast. Uh, it was challenging for some of the, like, learning. One of the things I had to do was learn how to read uh, programmer documentation. Uh, that's not always the easiest thing. So definitely, like, the, the Udemy courses and the blogs definitely helped out a lot there. There's a lot, of, a lot of examples out there for Flask, and that was extremely helpful, too. Um, one of the challenges I had is when I was doing some of these uh, operations that I'll show you in the demo of what I came out with was that I, did, I, could, I didn't really have an efficient way to do task management. So I actually found Celery, which is basically a back, background task management system that enables you to, to disconnect tasks from the, from the front end of that framework and then run all that in the background and then report back. Uh, so that was actually really cool when I, when I figured that out and learned that piece. 
Uh, I, I had known what Docker, Docker Compose were, but I've never actually used them. Now that I've been using these for months uh, on this project, I don't know how I ever did anything with Python without Docker. Docker makes things so easy. Uh, and I encourage everyone I talk to about anything when I'm talking to customers, when I'm talking to basically anybody that talks about technology, programming, et cetera, is to learn Docker and Docker Compose. It, it's just so, so helpful and it's just so universal that you can run it anywhere, right? It's super easy. Uh, then obviously all the source control Git, GitHub. Uh, I never really did a lot of stuff with Git before, but I, I really started to get into it, uh, learn like the command line stuff or how all that works. Uh, and then just learning about like branch, functional branching, merging, doing pull requests, things like that. A lot of that was completely unknown to me before. So it's all these like side, side skills. So as you're learning Python and you're doing a lot of this other stuff, like learning the HTML stuff or Flask, you're, you're taking in all of these other skill sets that just all tie together and you start to get a real understanding of like the ecosystem of tools that are out there and how they just kind of all tie in together and you can just really make a, a functional environment. And being an infrastructure guy, this is something I never really had any exposure to because it's, you know, we have our command line and we have our GUI and it kind of is what it is. But when you're looking at it from like a developer viewpoint, the open source tool sets out there is just so expansive. There's a ton of stuff out there. And when you look at that landscape and you try to think like, well, how am I gonna tie all these things in together? Um, and that's what I started to look at before I did this project, just talking to developers, figuring out their tool ecosystem, things like that. I never got it. And until I started using them to do this type of project, it just started to click for me left and right, uh, how all of this stuff can really tie together. You can, and I'm an automation guy at heart. I've been doing a lot of automation for a long time with ERA. Once I started to see all the stuff we could do in terms of automation for developer type of processes, I was kid candy shop, right? <laughs> and then uh, the, the last piece is obviously I wanted to use our, our own tooling um, since I have to learn that stuff anyway, which was CodeStream. So now CodeStream has actually been merged. It used to be a separate product. Now it's actually being merged directly into VRA, which is really good. Um, so I actually opted to use that to build a pipeline for how to build and deploy this as an OVA to the Dice. Uh, team's website so that customers and partners can easily download it and deploy it. And then we can get to the demo. Uh, is there any questions before we want to get to the demo? Uh, let me check real quick. Um, no, no. Uh, people are excited to see the demo. <laughs> so two, two sides to the demo. So I actually wanted to show what I have. Uh, window. There we go. So this one is the actual product of what it is. So whenever it comes up, you're just met with the screen and then you have two options. You have vCenter and you have vRealize Operations. You have a couple things here at the top. If you click on JSON, uh, that'll take you to the page where you can see all the task monitor, uh, the JSON files that have been generated, et cetera. Um, we'll have an, I have an example page that shows what an output in the JSON looks like so that before someone does a collection, they can actually understand what we're collecting and look at kind of what a sample information would be, right? And I have a simple help page to basically just tell like what data is collected, this is what it would be used for, et cetera. So back, back to this main page is we actually just have, we just fill out the, the simple variables for what we need and we can do a test connection and we can see that it actually connects and says connection successful. That was actually really cool for me to learn how to do that uh, and kind of separate that apart. Um, I was trying to figure out how to actually have the UI respond to these background tasks completing and just learning all these, these little incremental parts, basically features, right? It helped a lot of, it helped a lot to move this the skill sets forward that I was learning, but also my just understanding of everything that was happening. So on this screen, we can see that I have a couple of different things. So obviously I can see I generated a, a JSON file. Uh, I also have a task monitor. So this is actually, so, so Celery is actually running on a different port 
And what I did here is I'm actually pulling in um, from the Celery API just some information about a task that ran. So every time I run a task, it's going to populate that and just give me the information about the task name, the state, how long it took to run it, and if there was an exception or not. Uh, and then I can easily click to download these files if I want, open a JSON. Oh, yeah, that's running on browser, so that's not going to work here. Uh, but then I also, one of the things that I was able to drive with this is now instead of having to download a JSON file and then take, go to the Dice website and upload it, if this appliance actually has internet access, we can actually just take an API key and a secret and then just push directly a JSON file from this appliance into Dice into DICE through an API, and we never had that ability before. So that was actually some uh, functionality that I was able to drive on that side, not just this side. So that was actually really cool. Mm. Basic gist of it is that that's how the tool that's how the tool works. It's extremely simple. It's probably a, a lot simpler than some people think it is. Uh, but whenever we get in and we start looking at the source code, so oh, that is not what I wanted. So this is actually in a GitHub. Uh, that, this GitHub is a public repo, so anybody can come and clone the content. Uh, it's, it's mine. Um, not the official. One of the things that I found is whenever I was looking at this scenario, because uh, this tool is uh, containerized, right? So I found that I was using, there was, there was a three container model that I found somewhere in some blog and I could never just get it to work. So I actually had to, and it was Flask is one container, Celery is one container, and then Redis is one container. I actually ended up having to merge Celery and Flask into one container because I could just never get that model to work. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that I could keep this repo public that way in case someone else wanted to use it to like replicate some stuff uh, just to see kind of how it worked. That would be pretty easy to do. So you see I have it all through Docker Compose. So technically anyone can come and clone this and they can set it up. And if they have a vCenter or a vRocks, they can easily run it against it. That's pretty much all you need is the code to run it. Uh, the Docker Compose file is extremely simple. It just basically builds two containers. It builds the Flask container from the code that's in the repo. Uh, and then it actually pulls the latest Redis image that's available from Docker Hub. But other than that, we can see in the in the in the flash folders where I have basically everything I have. I have like the requirements file. So whenever the container gets built, it installs all the requirements that I need. Um, most of that has to do with like just the request, the request uh, module requirements, and then there's also the uh, the the PyVM Momi or whatever, however they call it, the SDK for for these right? So we have to use the uh, <laughs> Pi mommy, yeah, that one. <laughs> I, I don't. I honestly uh, don't know. Whenever I see it, I call it. I call it Pi V mommy. Uh, Kyle probably tell us how, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I never end up saying it right. I'm sure I found all the wrong ways to say it. Um, but yeah, so since the the REST API for vCenter is not fully complete yet, hopefully at some point it will be soon. But we had to use the SOAP API, which the that module helps us with. Um, so I actually had to build two separate modules for one for vCenter and one for vROPS instead of having one combined one. Um, and we can see I have several different copies here. I actually have some CLI versions so that you can log into a, log into one of the containers and execute the CLI version. I use that a lot for the debug testing. Uh, I actually use a couple partners labs and then a couple customers were actually helping me debug it as well. Uh, and then I have the actual GUI versions down here. And I tried to do some code separation so I wasn't just making huge monolithic files. Trying to really follow like the PEP standards and all that. Um, still getting better at that. Still a newbie. So there's a lot of things I could probably refactor and just make a whole lot better. It's not there yet. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 all, we all feel that pain. Um, a couple of, couple of uh, quick questions. Yep. Um, did you uh, hold on? Uh, did you build the requirements.txt using pip freeze? Yes. All right. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, that's usually the easiest way. And whenever you look at it, there's some, sometimes what they'll do. Uh, whenever you don't make, whenever you make one manually, you may just put in the module name, but you may know what version of 
module that you want, but I it was all new to me, so I actually just like let let Freeze decide what all I needed, gotcha. uh, and then just let it go. All right, and the uh, the follow up to the, that question was if yes, are you using virtual environments? So, in the testing on my main desktop and laptop, I am using virtual um, virtual environments. But then what I did is I started to see that just activating and maintaining a virtual environment was kind of a pain. Mm -hmm. So that's when, like I started to, so all of this started when I was just doing like the CLI version before we even started looking at what a GUI would look like, right? Mm -hmm. So I was doing everything in virtual environments because obviously like that's really the Pythonic way to do it is that way. But then I discovered like once we started to do the GUI piece and I had to figure out how to decouple this background task management all that, I discovered Docker and containers. I already knew what it was, but I've never really used it. So now that I have that, I have the requirements, and it basically builds in the Docker container. I guess it's gonna run it in a virtual environment in Docker, basically the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now, now I basically just run everything out of Docker instead of activating a virtual environment. If I'm just doing like some real quick script testing, I'll, I'll, do, I'll use virtual environments, but if I'm gonna actually building like a script that's gonna kind of persist, I'll try to put it in a container just because it's a lot easier to maintain. Gotcha. Nice. Okay. Cool. Thank you. That that was the uh, that was the last question. Awesome. Okay. So this GitHub is available for anyone to clone if they want. Uh, you can easily find it uh, under my name. It has literally the most commits uh, of all of my repos that I have. Also, as a as a shameless plug, I do have some repos out there for our new products around VRA. So we realize automation 8.0 is coming out soon. We also have the cloud version, so I do have some repos based around that, uh, the blueprints and playbooks and Ansible playbooks and things like that, right? So there's a lot of stuff out there. Cool. Um, and I'll, put, I'll put those. Uh, I'll put all those links in the show notes as well. Awesome. Cool. So then we wanted to look at. Let me make sure I'm still logged into this. Then I wanted to show the piece. So I've showed the tool, right? And what we've done with Flask and Python, and pretty much it's it's fairly simple in what it is. Um, I think in all, all in, it's probably less than a thousand lines of code that I wrote to do the VROPS and vCenter and then basically all of the web. Uh, I don't count any of the HTML in that just because a lot of that's just skeleton framework, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but of things that I, I wrote, I think it's probably around less, less than a thousand lines. So that's actually pretty cool. Awesome. Uh, and a shameless shout out to uh, Mr. John Diaz if he's on or if he's not on, he watches this later. But he actually helped me optimize my my realized operations rest calls extremely well because they were kind of slow before. Uh, but he showed me a much better way to do that in Python, and I was completely still thankful to him for that. Uh, just learning how to do rest better is amazing in Python, and it's so easy to do rest calls in Python. I mean, three lines, and you're basically done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, the second piece of this was the CodeStream piece. So in CodeStream, it's basically a CI CD pipeline tool for those that may not know what that is. It's continuous integration, continuous deployment. It's fancy developer agile terms, basically, hey, this is how I commit and roll code and update applications that are out there. Um, in terms of this, this isn't really updating an application because I don't really build necessarily an application like you would see in a more complex multi-tiered application. Basically, what I did is I built this pipeline, and I have a VM sitting on my home lab that is basically a Linux VM with the OBF tool installed, and it basically automates updating the virtual machine that I'm running this on in my lab, then doing all of the stuff that I need to package into an OBA and then push it along to where it needs to go. Um, it actually took us a couple hours just because we had a couple different people uh, with the DICE team that I'm working on to really like pull this down, build an OVA, hey, I got to test it against like, my environment's all 6.7, so obviously we need to test it against 6.5, 6.0, 5.5, back to what we really support, right? So we wanted, we wanted a better way to do that. It actually <laughs> taught me a lot more about um, build, building OVAs and like just the OVF files in general, if you've never seen some of those, uh, some of that stuff actually changes between versions, so you actually have to be very cognizant of what you're doing if you want it to span across different versions of vSphere and vCenter. 
Uh, and another shameless plug is Dr. William Lamb's blog was extremely helpful with that for learning just how to make your own OVAs if you're interested in doing that. Nice. Now, um, uh, a quick question. Uh, the, the VMware code stream uh, uh, service, is, is, that, is, that a, is that a native service that, that you can leverage, um, or, is that a, or is that a cloud service that you hook into? So this version right here that I'm showing is the cloud-based service. Mm -hmm. Whatever VRA 8.0 GAs, mm -hmm. um, that'll be on-premise code, and, VR, and code stream will actually be included in VRA Enterprise. So whenever you look at the cloud-based service today, what we did is we took VRA and we broke it down into three services. And those services are called Cloud Assembly, which is basically all of the infrastructure as a service components that VRA has been traditionally. So all of your blueprinting mechanisms, all of your endpoints for data collection, like your vCenters, your AWS, your Azure, et cetera, um, all your projects and things like that, all of that's wrapped in Cloud Assembly. Then you have Service Broker, which is basically the self-service catalog, uh, the user entitlement system, and then the governance piece of what VRA is. And then we have CodeStream, which was a separate product in VRA 7. It was CodeStream, I think the latest version is like 221 or 224, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a separate, completely separate licensed product. We actually decided to just fold that into VRA, make them a lot more interoperable. That way CodeStream could actually really act as a a functional bridge between cloud assembly and service broker for developers and other uh, types of consumers of VRA to easily consume infrastructure. Because one of the problems we've seen is that developers don't necessarily want to learn infrastructure, but they want to be very iterative and declarative in the way that they do things. Um, like declarative would be like the Ansible, the Terraform, that kind of functionality. But that's not technically the way we, we've done infrastructure or we understand how to do infrastructure. So really CodeStream can act as that bridge to kind of bring those two worlds together and just make infrastructure easy to consume, make it invisible to developers and just say, hey, I have this code. It needs to go somewhere to run to provide business services. So that's really how CodeStream kind of evolved to be a part of VRA. Nice, very cool. Uh, so, so one one quick question: um, uh, uh, Would would that could that be uh, you, you could that be effectively used to replace your Jenkins your Jenkins server Jenkins as a service so it, server? Sorry. So it, it could be. So if you don't if if someone doesn't have a functional CI/CD pipeline tool today, mm -hmm. uh, Coastrim could actually act as a, as a pipeline tool for you. Uh, what we've seen though is that a lot of developers, they don't, if they like a tool set, they don't want to get rid of it, right? Right, right, yeah. So when we look at the endpoints, we actually have Jenkins in here. So if you've ever worked with Jenkins, you've seen that Jenkins has a VRA plugin for version seven that, that we built and then we kind of put out there for them. Now we actually made it to where CodeStream, instead of having a separate plugin for Jenkins, we can just make Jenkins an endpoint natively and have it through CodeStream, consume all of the infrastructure pieces, right? So even if you use Jenkins, you can still use CodeStream as a bridge to do all that. Uh, it just makes the, the real consumption of infrastructure through Vue automation a, a whole lot easier than it used to be, uh, no matter what tool set you're using. Very cool. Um, so you see a lot of the a lot of the common endpoints in here are actually very common developer tools. So Artifactory, Bamboo, Docker, obviously, yep, all the yep. Git stuff. So in, in VRA, now it's like uh, source control is built in everywhere. So we want to be able to use GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, GitLab, pretty much yep. anything. So all of our actions, all of our blueprints, uh, all of our uh, uh, triggers from code stream and stuff, they can all be triggered from any of those. So what, what we don't want to do is put necessarily someone say, hey, you have to be in, in the VMware box, but we want to have VRA be the point to where, hey, you have a large VMware box, let's make it easy for you to use. And if you're a developer, that's going to be a, a bridge through CodeStream, and if you're an infrastructure guy, that's going to be through uh, Cloud Assembly, and if you're just an end user, it can be through the user catalog, which is Service Broker. Very cool. That's a smart move. 
So when we look at the pipelines, um, one of the things I really had to learn was like really understand like what a pipeline was. And I figured out that pipelines don't necessarily have to be dedicated to developers. Developers came up with this idea of what a pipeline is. And it's really made to suit what their needs are. So whenever you look at it, you'll see a pipeline will have stage one, task one, and task two, three, four, et cetera. And then you'll have another stage, another stage after that. And the stages could basically build, say, hey, build this code, uh, put it in a QA environment, test it against these scenarios, um, then package it all up and push it to production, right? That could be like what a pipeline is. So for infrastructure, you can actually use infrastructure as a infrastructure pipelines as a service and do infrastructure type things. So we can build we can build iterative machines. We can build fully sandbox environments, and I've been looking at making demos around a lot of that. But the the pipeline I made for this tool was basically, hey, I have this virtual machine in my lab. Take it, update it against the Hub repo where I've done all my commits. Uh, then once it's back up, check the app, app status, make sure the app's running, etc. Basically, just doing a rest call and doing a pull and making sure that it can. All through these pipelines, we can actually use variables throughout all of them. So you can actually link tasks across stages to actually, so you don't have to put in uh, hard code a bunch of stuff in there. You can actually make all of these variables and very iterative, very declarative, and then just have a set of variables that you're running everything off of, like all your host names, things like that. And you can just reference them from anywhere in the pipeline. It's actually really cool. Uh, then I have, obviously, whenever we do an OBS, we have to shut down the VM, so I have it connecting, doing a shutdown. Uh, I was finding some really, probably not the best way to do these, and I have some of this stuff that I'm going to refactor, but it made it pretty easy to do some of this. So just SSH and in, shutting down the VM that I have the container, basically the container host, uh, prepping the build environment, just making build directories to actually pull everything into, and then have all like the manifest file, the OVF file, uh, rerunning the, um, the the open SSL to do like the SHA signing on it. Uh, so you can see like basically the code. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah, there we go. So you can see like to build to build the OVA, like it's actually pretty simple, but even in the script thing, I can reference variables from the app. It's actually really cool. And it allows me to just easily template so someone could easily take this pipeline that comes out as basically YAML. All it is is YAML. And someone could take this and just change out all the stuff they want and then just plug it into theirs and just go to town and just build an OVA. Like you don't really need to um, do a whole lot of changes to refactor this for something else if you just want to build another OVA. You can see we have a lot of different uh, agent endpoints where we can do Map problems. There we go. So task types. We have a lot of different task types. So all of the native endpoints that we saw, then we also have some built-in ones. Uh, you can also build custom integrations. You can use PowerShell natively. You can do REST calls natively. Uh, you can do other user operations. You can use B-Rival Orchestrator natively. That's really cool as well. All these tasks can be set to be run on a conditional basis, and you can set conditional conditions for like, hey, did this task fail? And basically creating like a decision point. Hey, I want to run this task instead of this task, things like that. All through that, you can actually do notifications as well. So I actually had webhooks uh, running out to my own Slack workspace that is workspace is for me to use for testing notifications and things like that. So I've actually set this up to go out to our, our actual VMware one. So whenever we're building this in the production environment, it's actually notifying the types developers that, hey, this is done and this is ready to go. So as that pipeline moves down, we actually, so we push the prod. So after it's built the OVA, OVA in this Linux environment, it actually wants to, actually then copies that OVA to the product, the production piece of DICE, so on the DICE website. So whenever they do their nightly builds, it actually comes up and then it's available for easy download uh, from that system. And then we have a cleanup process. And then I have a couple other tasks that I want to add in here that I just haven't had a whole lot of time to work on. Uh, but that's basically what the pipeline looks like. Uh, we can actually, so we have a couple other tabs up here. So workspace tab, this is where we can use uh, all the Docker pieces. 
So if you have, if you just wanted to build against a Docker host or a Kubernetes host and just push some application code that can be containerized into some endpoints that you already have set up, like some PTS clusters, some OpenShift clusters, or just some standalone Docker hosts, kind of like the Zeke host or Photon host, uh, you can easily register and put those in here. You can also build out a bunch of inputs. Uh, you can see I have I made some pre uh, inputs out here. Then you can auto inject parameters from one of these other ones. But whenever I run this, yeah, it continues. It. It'll actually prompt me so that I can actually put in, change my build number, and then just set some stuff up. I can change the username and password. I can change the username and access in, right? And then just, then just run it. And it actually makes it pretty easy to go through. And then the pipeline just runs. As it runs, it notifies my Slack. Um, and then I know it's done. Uh, this build actually, so it took us a couple hours just because we had multiple people uh, working on it before. But now with this build and how we've done the OVF file, we tested it with the OVF to make sure it'll deploy to from 5.5 to 6.7, it'll deploy to Fusion or Workstation if somebody only wants to put it on their laptop or desktop. Uh, we've actually made that OVS. So now that we went for actually from a couple hours to make, to just get an OVA and get out to certain people to test, we've actually taken that down. It takes about 13 minutes to build it here. So we went from a couple hours to 13 minutes. So that's actually a huge improvement. Nice. So as we as we have pipelines, we actually have pipeline dashboards. So you can actually see when a pipeline dashboard is automatically created, and it'll actually tell you like it'll give you stats on like failures, successes. You can see I had a lot, I had a lot of testing I was doing, um, and then you can just see the recent executions, what's going on, different stages. It has some really detailed metrics on how you can actually see what's going on in your pipeline, at every task and every stage, and how it's just going see who it's initiated by, who, what's the uh, duration. You can take inputs and outputs. So if you want to you chain pipelines together or use nested pipelines, you can actually do that. You can have a pipeline that just does one function, and then it can actually send outputs from that pipeline into the pipeline that it's being run from just so it can return data and then just keep going back. Kind of like callbacks would be when you're doing code like in Python or JavaScript. <laughs> Then you can build custom dashboards as well. Uh, and then you can easily monitor your execution so you can see it's running. And we can look at one that's completed. We can actually see all of the information that uh, it had from the initial request. And we see I didn't have any output for another set. But then we can easily click into each stage and task. And we can actually see what, what, what the execution status was. It completed everything that the terminal saw whenever it was doing what it was doing. You can see it's actually rebuilding my containers and bringing the application back up. You can see all the log files where those are located. It also has a pretty cool uh, JSON output, so you can actually see all of this data comes out through JSON. So one of the big changes for VRA now is that before we had a REST API, and there was a lot of stuff you could do in there, but it was, it, it was pretty complex. But now everything is API back. So Pretty much anything can be run from, executed, or pulled from the API, and you never actually have to use the GUI. You can actually do all of this through API and through code, which is really amazing. Awesome. And you'll see, like, on every every task, we have the same kind of scenario. So you can see every single time what the, like, so this is my REST request. We can see I got the status code 200, which means it is okay and it's good. You can see everything that was returned. So you can see all the different elements of the of the HTML, uh, JSON output, and then just every single pass, which is awesome. And you see, like right here, it will tell you all the disk progress for building the OBA, and it just gives all the detailed information, all in the all in the execution panel, which is really cool. That's basically. Uh, the code stream piece, as well as the Flask tool piece. Nice. Um, so there, there was a couple of questions, and I didn't have a really good time to hit you up for them because they were a little bit outside of the scope of it. Um, yep. One question was, if somebody was trying to get into 
uh, doing so. You, so you had indicated that that Python on Docker had made life uh, significantly easier for you, and and blowing code down to containers was um, was was something that that you found very very useful, especially using virtual environments. What what um, what things did you learn, or what what tools did you use, or what resources did you use to uh, to get good at uh, containers, Docker, Python, committing to Python, committing to contain. I mean, excuse me, committing to uh, Docker containers. Yeah, so uh, I didn't really know like how to format a Docker file. So really, the first thing I did is I, I usually buy a lot of courses on Udemy. And just uh, another thing, I'm not sure if I'm saying right, uh, but <laughs> Easy website to find a lot of videos, right? So I, I took some Docker stuff out there uh, for a few hours just to make sure I understood like really what was going on behind the scenes with Docker. Mm -hmm. And then I did a lot of Googling. So I found a lot of blogs, uh, just example Docker files. I believe in the care method, so it's copy and reuse everything until you find something that works. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So taking, taking those Docker files from people that have been successful, finding other projects, other examples, and just trying out things and just seeing what works and what doesn't. Uh, I can definitely tell you that there were times where I was banging my head against the wall for hours. Oh, yeah. um, and I tend to do that because I don't make things easy on myself because, like I said, the best way for me to learn is to break things and then fix them and then make them some other way. Um, so definitely blogs, Google searching examples. There's a ton of examples out there for Docker. Uh, not all of them are good, um, but I, I believe that the, the not good examples are the ones that uh, probably help you learn the best, or they do for me at least. Uh, and then just like the video courses, if you don't under if you don't have a fundamental understanding of Docker and what it is and how to format files and what even in the files those things do. Uh, it's good to just have someone explain that to you, right? So that that's extremely helpful. Uh, gotcha. Reading the Docker documentation, um, that was very informative, but it was not necessarily helpful. So finding find examples, finding good people to explain it, amazingly helpful. That's a good point, because the, the, the Docker documentation is very dense. Uh, I will say that. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Uh, the the other question was if if um, if somebody wanted to get their hands on uh, or, or play with CodeStream as opposed to like Travis CI or or some other um, online available system, is there is there a way to get get your hands on CodeStream without owning VRA? Yeah. So today through the cloud service, we can actually do trials. So trials typically last between thirty and sixty days. Um, right now, that's the way to get CodeStream. Um, after VRA GAs, um, we'll have 8.0. We'll have CodeStream built in. I think um, I'm pretty sure the VRealize suite and the, the applications are offered through the VMUG Advantage program, right? So I think they'll be able to get it through that um, whenever they update the licenses on the VMUG Advantage. And then, as always, like if um, we have we have trials, so I think you can go to your My VMware downloads and you can submit for getting trials for VRA, right? Uh, that that would basically be how you would get it. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. And and if you really want to just like play, kick the tires on it, not not actually commit things to it, is there a hands-on lab for it? Uh, there is a hands-on lab. Uh, it is uh, HOL 1902-03. And I think it's today it's named Cloud Automation Services uh, and Log Intelligence. So if you just search for automation, you'll you'll find it. I don't think it's been renamed with the product naming that we just changed at VR at VMworld. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. All right. And uh, one last question: uh, Is there what was the GA date for V8 again? I know you said it, but we missed it. So. I did not say it. You did. Uh, <laughs> okay. I thought I I, 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 thought, I thought you said it. I said it soon. Um, it, it should be. It's going to be before Barcelona. So Barcelona is the first week of November. Uh, one addition to the last question is the VR8 handle labs will be released after Barcelona, which is the first week of November. Uh, so they'll have ability to see it the on-prem version through all those as well. Gotcha. Uh, it should be. It should be before Barcelona. So October. Uh, if I tell you a date, engineering is going to change it on me, and then someone's going to yell at me. Right. So I can't yeah, say exactly. it actually. 
so, uh, so but it's from on deck mode. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so the answer is soon. <laughs> Always soon. Cool. All right. Excellent. Um, let me uh, let me do a, a quick scan of the tweetosphere real fast. Uh, do, no, good there. Um, cool. No, I, I think I think we uh, we scraped all the questions. Awesome. Cool. All right. Any any, uh, any wrap ups that you want to do? Um, yeah. So here we can see the GitHub. I know you'll you'll take the links and you'll attach them to this. Uh, anyone can feel free to like just tweet at me. Like if you want to try the code out or you want to use it or you're having an issue, feel free to tweet at me. And if I can help, I'll try and help people. Uh, I, I got by for a long time in the last year with a lot of people answering a lot of questions. I know like Cody, Cody's been on here a lot. Cody probably ignores me, some of my questions now. Uh, <laughs> just because I've asked him so many and I've asked some Kyle, like I like helping people. Uh, so if you need help, feel free to ask me. And if I don't know how to do it, I'll definitely kind of try and point you in the right uh, direction to, to learn it. So, absolutely. Yep, that's that's what we're all here for. Uh, and and you're, and you're absolutely right. I uh, I irritate Cody to no end as well. So uh, between the two of us, I'm sure we we have his DMs blowing up. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, Tom, uh, thank you very much for for uh, for demoing that. That was that was an excellent presentation. Um, uh, I don't have any additional questions from the peanut gallery, so we will we will wrap another episode of V Brownback. Thank you everybody for uh, for coming this week. Um, next week we will be continuing the Python series, um, and it'll be our third to last episode. So we're we are finally winding down Python. Um, when I started this on January 30th, I thought that we'd have you know if we were lucky we'd have enough for you know, maybe a couple of months of material, and we are now at the end of the year. Um, so there, there, there we have the, uh, the 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 desire for people to learn Python has been has been very evident. Um, again, Tom, thanks very much. That was awesome. We, we really appreciate you coming in and showing this showing this uh, 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 the V not CAS VRA Cloud. <laughs> Absolutely, anytime. Cool. Cheers, everybody. Have a uh, have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you again next week.